girls, my name's Dan. Welcome back to The Forge. In this episode of Rough and Ready, we're going to be talking about some of the other skills you need, rather other than hitting hot metal, to be a blacksmith. These are some drawings that I've done for a commission for a customer. Um, and there was a quote and everything based off this, but I thought the first thing that we need to talk about as skills that you should really have as a blacksmith, if you, especially if you want to do architectural work, is the ability to draw. I think I tell um, students that come up and work with me, especially if they want to do the BA, that one of the things, Elliot, come here. <laughs> come, come here. What did I tell you when you first came and you were said you wanted to do degree? You need to what? Draw. Learn to draw. How often do you draw? Not a lot. Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. A little bit of fun there? Yeah. So whenever the students come up, the first thing they say, if they, if they ever want to do the degree course, is they have to say to them, you have to learn to draw, and you have to draw a lot. You have to draw every day, especially if you're going to do the degree, because you need to be able to produce drawings that you can show to customers, so you can prove concept. Um, and visually demonstrating that with a drawing or a model or maquettes or a 3D printed image. Any, any of those things are the same, but they still de demand a little bit of time and input. Basically, the, uh, the remit was fireplace guard. I saw the fireplace. I've got some pictures um, of the fireplace. In fact, if I can find them, I'll, you'll see some pictures now of the fireplace guard. So we went down there, measured up, took took some ideas from the customer, what they might like and how they might like it to look. And then these are concepts, but these are two scale concepts. So the drawings themselves are relatively accurate. Um, and then I put them together in a way that they are presentable. So I could have just left these as pen and line drawings, but I've shaded them in and I've used um, sort of perspective angle of light coming from one direction I've tried to stick to that actually it's coming from this side but doesn't matter um, but yeah to try and make it look presentable to the customer that was and I've also produced oh a little beetle I've also produced uh, I produced three different types of drawings for the customer and then what I've had to do is draw this or what I like to do personally is draw this full size so on the next page I've got another job uh, that I'm looking at doing. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, this is for a side for a personnel gate. These aren't great. I, I mean, I'm, I've got pictures. I could probably put up some of the pictures of these, but um, I will shade this in and show you it uh, later when it's been shaded, so you get to see the difference between this and um, the other one. Okay, so this is my pencil case. Oh, it's not very glamorous, I know. Um, I'm just going to dump it out just to show you what's in here. Um, I think my most valued implement that I own in my pencil case is a mechanical pencil. It's 0.5, uh, 0.5 mil uh, pencil lead. Um, and I've had this for 11, 12 years now. It's the same pencil. And it's pretty much done every single drawing that I've ever done. Other people have bought me mechanical pencils, but this is the one that I love and adore. Um, obviously I've got my mechanical pencil leads. And now I've got a variety of leads here. Everything from a H, which is a hard lead, H2 even harder. I don't know if that is actually what it stands for, H. Uh, but then I've got a B and I've got a HB as well. Slightly softer uh, leads allow you to put more lead down. So I've got a variety of leads for the pencil. Instead of having like 100 pencils, not that you'd have 100 pencils, I've got one pencil and a variety of leads. I've got a slightly bigger Pencil, I don't use that very often. I don't like the weight on that one. And this one as well is quite heavy, but this is a 0.5. It's quite heavy. It, it works. Uh, another HB there. Uh, some more lead as well. So pencils front, but I also carry with me, I also carry uh, a series of normal pencils. And I like these because the, the leads tend to be a lot fatter, especially for doing the coloring and shading and stuff like that. Uh, and, and these are all H's, uh, HB pencils as well. There's nothing special about the H, these pencils. A biro, biro is always good, especially if you're trying to write numbers and down stuff. I find uh, the fine liner pens tend not to be as easy to write with, so I always carry one of those. 
I don't know, I've got highlighters in here. Uh, they've come from something, but I don't remember what I've got them for. A screwdriver, <laughs> I don't know why that's in there. And uh, fine liners, and I normally carry a couple of these. I just haven't had a chance to replace some of them. I normally carry a, point, a 0 0.05, a 0 0.1, and a two as well. Obviously rubbers are really handy, especially when you're laying stuff out. And um, I also carry a couple of compasses. I haven't got the other compass out, I'm not gonna get the other compass out, but this compass I use um, to hold my uh, fine liners. But the thing with compasses as well, I used to spend a lot of money on compasses, but it doesn't matter how good your compass is, you use it for a while and Tends to, call, tends to get worse and worse as you use it. You end up doing up the screws, and because compasses, I don't think compasses are made very well anymore, they tend to rip themselves to pieces. So I've gone down the avenue of buying two relatively cheapy compasses. I'll get the other compass. Yeah, compass. Uh, I have one of these uh, fixable ones. I find that they work best for drawing with the lead that you can replace. I, again, I don't stop spending a lot of money on compasses. They just die. Um, they last a couple of years and then they're, they're knackered. Doesn't matter how much money you spend on them, so just buy some cheap ones because you're going to have to replace them anyway. Um, I like to use a scale ruler. Oh, I've got quite stubby thumbs, so I find holding a scale ruler nicer uh, than I do working with um, uh, working with uh, like one of the flat plastic rulers. I find that they move all over the place, but sometimes a clear ruler is good. Um, I also quite often use a square, so this goes on the side of your sketchbook or whatever. I find that quite nice. Sometimes I draw with a drawing board, sometimes I don't. And uh, to complement my compasses, I also use a set of French curves. These are really cheap. You can find them in most hobby craft shops and they are a series of fixed shapes and curves. And they pretty much help you do some of these nice lines that I've managed to get from these drawings. So uh, that's basically what I carry in my pencil case. I uh, pretty much can draw anything with these, um, give or take. Um, and then it's just time after that. It's the only other thing you need really for drawing. Something that I like to do is I like to have a collection of smaller sketchbooks that I can jot ideas down on and stuff like that so that um, I can come back to them later or I can show them to customers or I can use them to work through uh, how I'm going to make something when I come to it much later on um, or when I come to draw it up in my big sketchbook. Having the ability to do the line drawings or the technical drawings uh, to scale um, and then also to do like a freehand drawing and then also being able to do some sort of CAD uh, if that's SolidWorks or uh, Autodesk like I use or some of the free packages like SketchUp that you can get online from Google um, <clears throat> are all, all ways that you can bolster your drawing skills. Now I definitely recommend, like I said before, you should learn how to sketch. Uh, especially um, uh, sort of a, a sort of isometric sort of styly sketch or a three-dimensional sketch it makes it easier to translate to customers. It doesn't have to be amazing, it just shows what you can do. Uh, pen and line drawings in quite good um, detail and then also nowadays with a, most computers can run a really basic 3D drawing program as well. So I definitely recommend learning some of that as well. And something else that you need to be able to do, and we're gonna talk about this now, is draw big. So this is the actual size of the piece. Um, well, it's half of, um, and I've not made the board quite long enough for this actual finial that's gonna go on the end here. Um, but by drawing it out on a piece of ply or MDF or, um, or any, any sort of board and then painting it white, gives you the ability to do a couple of things. Firstly, painting it white means it's easier to draw on, uh, which is a hell of a, which is really, really helpful, especially um, when it's quite detailed. I mean, this isn't a mega detailed project, but it is nice to be able to see the pencil lines and be able to sketch like you would if you were in your sketchbook. And then by painting it white, we can paint it white to get rid of any of our errors. It helps you see the lines, especially once you pen them in, because the wood tends to soak up the pen quite a bit. It can be a bit difficult. But we can also, um, we can also paint over this, once we've finished with it, with white again, uh, and uh, use, use the piece of wood for another project. Um, 
by drawing it to size helps us do a couple of things. I had a spacing problem here from my original drawing and I've managed to fix that now. Um, I can also see how big things are going to be and if I'm not happy with that I can modify those as we go along. Um, but I'm also able to measure these distances and it gives me a better chance of getting the right stock size. And also as I make the components I can lay them on here and as long as this is square and correct I can match up my metalwork to this piece and make essentially the piece from the drawing. Uh, it's, it's a great way to get a final result. Another really valuable skill to have is a basic understanding of maths. How to work out the volume, or well not the volume, work out the uh, area of a square, the area of a circle, um, how to estimate stock. These are all things that you're going to have to do if you want to do architectural work. Um, and also a little bit of spatial awareness, understanding how something's going to fill an area, but I guess it's sort of like a geometry based understanding of um, what it is you're making. I don't know if this is something that you can learn. I've just always been okay at it. I've never had it. But if you do struggle with those sorts of things, this is another reason why drawing this out on a larger scale is a good thing to do. So I've got myself some string here, a bit of paracord, and I'm gonna use that uh, to run along the center of each one of the uh, sections um, I know what the sections are going to be. If the, this was a drawing for someone else, I might write what the sections are going to be. So these are inch by 3 eighths or 25 by 10. Um, and then this piece here is uh, 20 square or 3 quarters of an inch square and so on. So basically what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to take a ruler uh, and a piece of string and I'm going to go through and I'm going to work out all the lengths and distances uh, that I need um, to cut the material off and then I'm going to write a cutting list along here and then we should know uh, all the parts. I might even just mark these up as A, B, C, D, so on and so forth so that we know which length goes to which place. There's elements on this piece that involve complicated forging processes or multiple forging processes, not necessarily complicated, but multiple forging processes. And um, that in itself requires a different way of working out the stock. So we're going to move on to making the little finial samples. Um, we've got, I've got two pieces of bar, uh, but what I've done is pretty much basically what I said before. I've got 100 mil here, four inches, and I've got two inches here. Um, or 50 mil. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set down here and we're going to take this down to about 10 mil I think um, and we're going to do that with a set of, a couple of different types of tooling underneath the power hammer and then what I'll do is I'll measure how much material we've got here and then I'll work on the actual central finial part um, after I've drawn that out because we can cut it off then but I've got two Okay, the finials are done, they've come out lovely. I've had the lads finish all of the finials for me uh, as a bit of a training exercise for them. Um, and as you can see, we've done the set down, we've forged the material out square, then we've taken it round with a set of spring swages. So let's measure to see what length we have. So these shorter ones, we're using uh, the 100 um, the hundred mil and then the 50 mil. So if I just measure this one, they're about the same, these. 
So yeah, they're all coming in around about 300 to 310 millimeters, uh, one foot to one foot, and a quarter ish, roughly maybe three eighths. So um, that's quite nice. Um, they're all done now, but what you can see from that little exercise is how you need to plan your material usage slightly different than if you were just running long flat bars. So the next thing that we're gonna do in the next episode is put the tenons on. We've got some tooling to make for that. We'll be making some spring swages. Are we going to? We might have some spring swages actually, but I'll be showing you all about that process uh, and we'll be making a new guillotine tool as well. Talking of new tools, let's move on to doing some of the bending. So I'm going to be moving on to doing some of the bending processes now. Um, a lot of them are going to be done cold. And the reason for doing that is because uniformed heat allows you to bend things more evenly. And I've got a little bit of tooling that I'm using under the fly press. You're going to see me making this piece here. This is one of the bolsters for one of the doors. Um, but you're going to see me making this piece now. Uh, and um, I'm going to show you using it and how we use the drawing in combination with the bending uh, tools. Um, so you can see that for yourself. This is going to get explained a little bit more in the next episode uh, as, as a bolster. Um, but I'll just show you the bending tool before we move on and start doing that. This lovely piece of equipment here is what we call a bending jig. It's basically two laser cut frames uh, and then it's got these series of holes and spacers put in it so that you can use the tooling in the actual uh, slide, the arbor or the die, whatever you want to call it. And then pinch the steel between the two points Right, so, and bend up your material. Now I'm using a fly press to do this, and you could do this with a hydraulic press, or you could do it with, um, you could do it with a bottle jack. Now I think I'm gonna be selling these kits up on the Etsy very shortly. Um, but basically all they are is a series of, um, series of these uh, pins that you can put into different locations, and dependent on the distance apart, depends on the kind of arc you get when you try to bend your material up. So watch this next bit where we bend up some of the sections and uh, yeah, I'll tell you more about this in an up and coming video. Yep. So this is a bar that we're bending up cold and I'm not sure if you can see, so this is the line that I want to catch, this bottom line, which is pretty good up to here and then I need to bring it in tighter but I'm pretty sure that the radius up to about here is going to be good. So what I need to do is get a pinch on this line here and that should hopefully bring it in one pinch, just one tiny pinch. So I'm going to do that and then bring it back. So, it's not perfect, but I don't think my pen line's perfect. I've got that coming up there now, so I'm quite happy with that. So this is gonna become the bolster that we're then gonna to use to bend this piece up. So these top ones, the hole's quite big, so we need to bolster each one so that we can punch it at an angle, basically. But you'll see that later. Reasonably good start. We've got, um, I've got most of the components for the, um, actual railings uh, or the gates bent up now so the they these three pieces or six in total and we've got most of the finials made now and i've also started work on you will have seen me bending these up on these parts which are going to be bolsters so i'll bring you in a bit closer to explain why i'm making the bolsters um, but it's coming together so next episode um we will be talking about the tenons on the bottom of here um, I will be going over doing the little heels and joints and stuff that we've got to do um, and working out ways of doing that so there'll be some more sampling to do. And um, yeah, so there'll be a bit more forging in the next one as opposed to drawing and talking about drawing. And we'll also be covering these bolsters, which I'm going to show you just now. Um, what we're going to end up having is a series of holes that need to get punched on an angle, um, or well, at least drilled and then drifted to size so they need to be 10 mil round these parts are 10 mil round and uh, what I've done 
is I've made these components here that mi oh we'll get this around the right way now. So no, it was right the first time. So these components here mirror the bottom line, they mirror this line here, so that we can lay this piece of material down, um, which will be bent up to some degree, and then uh, we can then spot drill the hole, and then after we spot drill the hole, we can drift it out to size, and then we can slip each one of these through. So we bolt it to this as we're going along. So that was the purpose of these but they need a bit more work yet they're going to need something so that they sit flat on the drill press because we need to be able to drill the holes flat um, and then uh, well so that they come through at 90 to the bottom of this we need some support going in they all need to be the right size and we need to do these end pieces so this time last year i was lucky enough to get to go out to ohio and uh, teach some hammer making classes on the john coffee ranch uh, where I met up with a lot of members of Quad Squad and some people that just come to do classes themselves. Um, it was a really cool experience. Everyone was super lovely and thank you so much for your hospitality. But not only that, I got to go over to the Quad State grounds and go and have a look at some really cool stuff over there as well. And I also got to meet some really cool people, not only the Quad Squad themselves, but also some of the other YouTubers and some other popular blacksmiths. Uh, out in the States, which I really enjoyed. Um, I met up with Roy Adams, Tim from Big Dog Forge, and also I bumped into uh, Brian Brazil, and it was quite interesting to see him work as well. So there's a little bit of everything in here. Hopefully I've got everyone in there. And again, thank you to everyone out in um, Ohio who looked after me so, so well. Thank you very much. Um, enjoy this bit, and um, I'll see you at the end. So day three of the courses, the last set of courses, and I'm going to take you around John Coffey's ranch. I love that movie. Yeah. I love both yeah. versions of it. Yeah. Watch the eyeballs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Both sides, turn it to 180. Yep. I don't want to up in. One more time, What's the matter, yep. John? You don't want to catch another one on fire? Yep. Give me two. They don't realize it's going to be 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 going to
you come down to the grounds where Quad State's being held and I've stumbled across Uncle Buck's stall. So he's the guy who provided like all the leg vices, uh, leg vices, uh, the striking anvils and all the guillotine tools. So I'm going to show you around. I'm going to use this sledgehammer. I've already been using it. Harder. Okay. Yeah, we need to penetrate. You got a mark. I, I need to get my, you know, make sure it's straight. So. All right, here. You got something? Yeah, I'm working. Yeah, there we go. You don't, don't have a whole lot of stick in the choke. Thank you so much again, Quad Squad, and thank you, John, for your hospitality. Uh, once again, I think he is having the guys over for a little bit of a shindig, so he's a great guy. They've done it a couple of years in a row now, and um, it's a seriously great way for people to get together and um, share their experiences, have a bit of fun, and then go off to Quad State and meet up with some other people. So they're an amazing group, so well done to them for being super awesome human beings. I'm going to leave the video there, so thank you for joining me. Hopefully you did enjoy this video. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you are a subscriber, why not ring that bell for notifications? It tells you every time I make a video. I try to make videos once a week. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes a few more come out. Um, but if you'd like to support the channel in any way, shape or form, there's a few other ways other than liking and then subscribing that you can do that. One way is to leave a comment. Let me know what you thought of what's been going on in this episode. Let me know of things that you would and wouldn't like to see further on in the episode because I am very keen to try and help and share uh, things that I've learned and um, the way to do things. So just drop a comment down below. Let me know what you thought. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what you'd like to see. Also, Share this video with your friends on other uh, social media platforms. That's a great way to get um, the traction on the video. And also, you could go over and check out my Instagram. I've been sharing a lot of the stuff that's been going on in this episode on the Instagram. You can also, you can also help by uh, going over and checking out my Etsy. I sell loads of really cool blacksmithing stuff over there. Everything from hammers to tongs to stock. I will be stocking these laser cuts. I've got a few different little laser cutty projecty things coming up soon that you'll be able to get your hands on and t-shirts will be available soon. We've fixed the problem. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one there. Um, okay, I'm gonna leave the video there. I'm gonna leave a link up here to uh, a video that YouTube thinks is good for you. This one down here is a most recently uploaded video. This one down here is um, the last rough and ready, I should think, and this one here is the subscribe button. Thank you so much for joining me. See you later. Goodbye.